Now, from high atop his desk, get ready to peel it all back and get to the root of the subject. No pun intended. With Paul K on Wine Talks, where he takes no prisoners and calls it the way he sees it. Hey, welcome to Wine Talks with Paul K. We are available, of course, on your favorite uh, podcast hangouts, Google Play, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Pandora, you name it, we are there. And always sponsored by the original Wine of the Month Club, uh, touting some pretty interesting clubs now, the Napa Series, the Sweet Series, the Natural Wine Series, etc. This is the beginning of an incredible uh, series of podcasts and interviews I'm going to do and we're going to start right at the core of this whole idea of the judgment of Paris. I have Mr. George Tabor on the line with us today. And I just want to welcome you to the show, George. This is going to be a lot, a lot of fun. Great. Well, I'm very happy to be here with you. Thank you. Um, can you tell us, you know, I want, I think this story needs to be told. I lived through it in my teenage years. Uh, there was a movie on it, you know, bottle shock, which really didn't do the story justice after reading your book. What did, the judgment of Paris start out to be? What was Mr. Spurrier's idea in the first place? Just the cursory look at it. Well, he basically, you know, it, um, you know, he didn't c consider it to be, a, you know, a, a type of, a, of an event where, you know, the winner, big winners and big losers, uh, but just basically to show people what was happening in, in, in other places around the world in, in, in making outstanding wines. So I've given this book, uh, copies of this book, and you see them over my shoulder here. Um, I've given many out to friends who are now becoming wine enthusiasts. And, and I had a young lady in the office yesterday, uh, just graduated from college, and she, her father and I are friends, and she's, she wants to get in the wine business. And we'll talk about that too in a little bit. But I said, before you do anything, particularly in California, you need to read a copy of this book because it's going to tell you so much about the history and what happened back in 1976 and that carries all the way to today and here's this wine shop in in uh in paris rue de madeleine mr spurrier is an englishman right yep who fancies himself in wine and you're a young journalist just out of college a little bit more than that, but you know, I was I was still in my I think I was still in my twenties, certainly not twenty, it was early early thirties. But you know, I was I was still a kid. Put it that way. <laughs> and so, as a journalist, you you moved to Paris, right? Yes. Yeah. And so, I and this young lady is so interesting because she's like, and I want to go to I want to go to Europe and I want to study wine. I'm like, wow, this is. I've heard part of this story before, but what took you there as a young journalist to decide um, that this was the place to go? Was it, was it the wine? Was it the food? Was it the lifestyle, the French young girls? Was it the young women there? What? <laughs> well, all of the above. I mean, it was, you know, um, you know, we, I'd heard a lot about life in, in France. But until you really get there, you don't appreciate what just just wonderful th things can happen there. You know, you, uh, you know they, City they of have a great interest in wine. Uh, all all sorts of things just happening. You know, the fact that Stephen, who was an Englishman, why why in the hell was an Englishman doing in in, in you know in Paris for? Or, or, or why was an American? Why was I in Paris? And well, the re the answer is that they they all were in in you know in love with the 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 the, the wine and life size the, 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 just the, the wonderful things that happened when where wine was taking place. City of Lights. Yes. Sure. Yeah. Uh, so set, you're talking set. When did you get there? Seventy something. Uh, yeah, I was I was there about well about three years before the actual event. Yeah. And you were were you in, and I, this part's just my own curiosity because the it's in your book, but I didn't quite grasp it. But were you an employee of Time Magazine or were you an ad hoc journalist that submitted? No, I, I was a full full employer uh, of Time. 
Okay, and you were I, studying. I worked for time for a couple of years uh, in, in the United States, but then, you know, I had, had pretty good French. Uh, they didn't have a lot of people uh, who could work, work, the, work, work the business, as it were, uh, in, in, Fr in France. And so that's how, in effect, I, I got there. Well, so were you, you went there particularly for food and wine, or was it was Time Magazine? No, no. Yeah, I, I, you know, you, in those days, you know, you only, you know, you, you'd have in any given week in a, in a story, story, you know, you'd have four or five stories that you would have to do. So, you know, this was just another story. I mean, another it wasn't story. kind of the major story of my life at that point. No. <laughs> which, it did, which it turned out to be, obviously. We're going to yeah. wait to talk about that. But so, I, yeah, the wine trade, and, and I'm going to reflect back in Pals Verdes, and there's one of your paragraphs, chapter 16 of the book talks about Pals Verdes, actually. But that's where my dad's store was. And, you know, the wine trade in America, particularly in California, was it was restricted to a few great houses and, and some passionate people and some pioneers. There was certainly no trade. In fact, I love talking about the idea that I would stock the shelves with Sebastiani and it would say 100% Cabernet on the label because we were so proud of the idea that, you know, we didn't blend grapes in those kinds of, in those days. But my dad's shop was sort of uh, a forefront of Los Angeles. There were five shops. If you, if you talk to Bruce Nyer, he'll tell you there were five shops in 1972 that you could visit in Los Angeles to sell anything. And, well, <laughs> and wine is one of them. So, so I know that Patricia Gallagher is part of this, and there's this idea now. Ruta Madeline, okay, well, actually, I have a different question. What was the climate of wine in Paris? Obviously, the French love their wine. They're much more acclimated to it at that time than America was. Was the corner wine shop a regular thing in Paris? Oh, yes, very much so. And then, you know, uh, what Stephen was smart enough to know was you know that he could become the the wine master for Americans, Englishmen, you know, f f all all the foreigners in around Paris, and that's that's why he he got there. See, he's due on the show. Uh, I guess he's coming to Napa um, in a few months, and uh, I'm going to meet him up in Napa and, and try and podcast with him. He's a friend. He's a good friend of a, another friend of mine, Melvin Masters, who's a great negotiant. Um, so here you are. Uh, how did you hear about the idea that that Steven Sperry was going to put on this California versus French tasting? Was it a well? It's a, Stephen had a variety of of of, of, of things that happened. Um, you know, he, he, he would have he would do things that a lot of Frenchmen wouldn't do. <laughs> uh, and so he would just, you know, if he wanted to, to do something, he said, "Okay, let's let's do it. Let's let's we'll get a couple of bottles of wine and see what what it what it tastes like." <laughs> and that that's what he was always there. So he always had something new and something po property that you know was 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 good for him. Something was going and on it, because it, because he, you know his his main job was of course was to sell wine. <laughs> Right, that's what we, that's what he was, that went for. But that's and the right. Englishman, I mean, the English sort of controlled uh, what through the fifties, really the, the distribution of Burgundy and Bordeaux in 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 England. Right, they were quite prolific in the trade of wine, French wine. Oh, sure, for thousands of years. Yeah, they pretty much run the show, right? And, and yeah. that's so. He has a store. He, I, I don't know. I don't remember what Patricia Gallagher's relationship with him was. Was she part of the school that he was putting on? Is that what? The... Exactly. Yeah, they had they they, they had schools uh, and programs and things like that. And that's how I attended a couple of those things. And that's how I first heard about the the Judgment of Paris coming. Just so because you, I was there. The, so you attended those on as a just a personal. Uh, you know, education on wine. You you liked wine. Uh, exactly. Yeah. yeah I'm go because, check it out. Yeah, yeah. Because you know, wine was wine was still for me in those days. You know, it was uh, uh, you know it was something almost very hard to get your hands around it. I sure. was not wasn't an expert in it, and so you know, I, I just it was great to have somebody like Patricia and Stephen who could tell you about a wine tasting or he, he also had shops, you know, not shops, he had, he also had, you know, visits around, uh, around the various wineries. Oh so, yeah. Right. Little tours yeah. and things. Yeah. 
so I just, you know, I just want to place myself there, right? Because, you know, if you read, um, if you read uh, uh, A Movable Feast from, from Ernest Hemingway and you, you, you read about the, the, the romance of Paris in the 20s and you fast forward, I think there was still tons of romance in the 70s. It was yeah. still not as commercial as it is today. And the Champs Elysees was, you know, a place to hang out. And, and here's this young Englishman who's got a wine shop. He's got a class. And here's a young American who's come to it there to, to just document something uh, in the French or culture. Learn about, about, about wine. I mean, yeah, no, about I, wine. I was in, in, in France at that time, but I didn't know an awful lot about wine. When I had, had grown up in California, we never had wine at, at home. You know, it's yeah, hard that's to true. believe. It. Now, Where, every night I have a wine that today, but in those days, I never... Ever just had where was where where, where did you grow up in California? Uh, at Riverside. On oh, Riverside, wow. Well, you know that's the birthplace of wine in California, right? I mean, yeah. Hukamanga, yeah. in the 1700s. This is a great story. I don't know if you've read the book from uh, from Francis Deaconspiel. It's called uh, Tangled Vines. It's an incredible story. Mm, uh, it's nice. the it's um it's the let's see arson murder and fraud in the wine business. That's what the story uh -huh. is. <laughs> so it starts with, but it starts in Rancho Cucamonga in the plantings in the 1700s and how it moved to, to Napa. But that's a different story. She's going to be on the show too soon. Um, okay. So you've been, you know, I grew up with the, I, the picture, the, the iconic picture of, of my dad's store and my, and my father and I is standing in front of his first display of the wine of the month club. This is 1975. And uh, we had featured the Chateau Montalena 72 Chardonnay and uh, you know we were well acquainted. My dad was on his way as a very academic guy. He's got his master's in pharmacology, so he's trying to understand wine, having bought a wine shop. And and you're in, you're in uh, Riverside, and you know the culture of wine really wasn't around here. It was more on the East Coast, I think, probably because we we're so much closer. I, I think there was a lot more wine in those days, and on, on the on the on the East Coast than there was on the West Coast. In fact, I was. One of the stories, my dad was reading an article in the LA Times in 1959 or 58 when, when Queen Elizabeth came here and, and Dwight Eisenhower hosted her and he poured Charles Krug uh, Vineyard Select uh, at, at one of the lunches, not at the dinner. It was the first time a California a president had poured a California wine there. So, you know, history goes back to the 50s. So, um, so now I've got Steven Spurrier and Patricia Gallagher to put on these things. There's a young George Taylor there who's documenting things in Paris. And he, I understood from your book that they invited, you know, Gomio and Michelin and all the rest of the periodicals and possibly some American ones, maybe Life Magazine as well, to come to this tasting. Yeah. And no, no, because, you know, and nobody thought anything would be happening there. I mean, you know, everybody knew the French were going to win. I mean, of it, you know, that's, it's crazy to even have this thing. But if you're going to have it, if you know the French are going to have one. So why waste the time of going to have? But I was lucky, smart. Yeah. <laughs> I decided to show up and, and see what happened. <laughs> You know, we kind of we kind of give ourselves enough credit, even when things maybe we don't know that we're being lucky or we're that we're being smart. But whatever it is, you know, it created this amazing uh, opportunity. In fact, I have a copy of the magazine here, uh, and just to highlight that, Jim Barrett did walk into my dad's store after the June seventh edition of the Time Magazine from 1976 and said, "Not bad from for a couple of guys from the sticks," which became one of his famous quotes, right? Yes. Uh, yes. And, and they had tasted together at, at Les Amis de Vent, so. So here, so tell me what the structure of the tasting was. What, from your book, is very granular about what happened, but he decided to use French judges, which is an amazing idea in itself, right? right. Yeah, because in fact, it was, it, I think the, one, of the thing, one of the things that's really important to understand is, was the, the way that what Stephen doing, was doing was to try to introduce to the French, not to the, the, the Americans, but to the French, what was happening in wine in other places of the world. And California, you know, was just one of, the, one of those places that was also making wines. Most Frenchmen never had, had tasted a wine, but, uh, you know, Stephen didn't, that, that didn't matter to Stephen. He just wanted to show it to, to the, the Frenchmen of what was going on in, in, in the United States. And especially and, in California. 
So he invited chefs, he invited uh, noted uh, wine uh, authors, noted wine critics, um, people he, 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 he got the best that he could do. Really? And he, 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 there's no, he got the best. There was just no question about it. He didn't go out in the field and said, you know, grab somebody. And he's, you know, he went and he went out and said, okay, look, up. I'm really important. If you want to have, have something to do with today, uh, come and have, taste, taste this wine tasting. You, but you might find it's interesting. But nobody had ever say, hey, the California wines are going to win. <laughs> yeah, well, my guess would be that they're like, oh, you know, I'll do it for fun to see some old friends maybe, you know. Sure. Oh, yeah, yeah, wine, yeah. You know, have a good time. Yeah. So, and it was held in a hotel. It's still there. Um, forgot the name of the hotel now. Yeah. I, he I took it, but he got a room in a hotel. It's in my book. <laughs> yeah, it's in the book. <laughs> and um, and they have, I forgot how many judges there were. Nine? Eight. Yeah, eight, nine, something like that. Yeah, and so tell me about the, like you're sitting there, you're this young man, uh, you've learned a little bit more about, more about wine since you got there, and uh, you, you respect these people that are sitting there. And what's Well, the one of the things that was really important was, I was the only, since I was the only journalist that was there that day, I could get go around and I could listen to the, to the, 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 the winemakers, you know, to do their testing, make their comments and all that. So, you know, very quickly it became inter interesting because the, the judges were starting to get confused. You know, they weren't, they didn't just pick up a, a glass of wine and say, oh, that's, that's French wine. You know, that's, of course, that's, that's an excellent wine. Yeah. This, this other stuff with it. I don't know what this other stuff is, but that's, that must be California because it's terrible. And then, then I'd look at the card and I'd, I'd say, Hey, that's the, the they, they had just <laughs> tried French wines and the and California wines. And, and these, these guys, they liked California wines better <laughs> than that's their own. So the, but the format was double blind, right? So they bagged them and they actually yeah, decanted yeah, them. Yeah. yeah. They took them out of their original bottles so the Frenchman couldn't decide based exactly. on the, the well, yeah, no, they, 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 were, they made, they, they did it all, you know, correctly. Yeah. And so the, there's a comment in one of the, in your book, and it's also my dad's newsletter, which much you must have gotten from your article in Time Magazine, about one of the French, one of the judges saying, ah, after you tasted, I think, one of the whites, he thought it was tasting Merceau when he was you know, actually drinking one of the shards. And he yeah. said something like, ah, oh, we're back in France. And he tried, what was the wine he got? He yeah, got the right. California right there. <laughs> I mean, you and I know how hard it is, even oh, for a trained, uh, a trained psalm or a trained master of wine to identify like that, right? This, it's not that easy. And, the, and there's a lot of elements that can confuse you. And here these folks are in this area, and they're pretty confident now he's... he's well, you know, these left. were, you know, these were the best wine experts that France had to offer. Oh, no. <laughs> That's amazing, and so they, and now we've tasted all the white wines, and then they, they they scored them by the group. So they did the whites first, and then they announced the results at that point. Yes. And how was that? What was the temperature of the room at that moment? <laughs> well, at that point, then they, there was a lot of concern that you know, in effect, they they had selected the California California wines first, and so they wanted to make sure they weren't it wasn't going to happen the second time in a row. <laughs> And sure enough, <laughs> second time in a row, they lost. They, the, the California wines won. Well, it's and they, not. And the French, you know, they just did not understand what was happening. When, you, when we look at the score, and my dad published those two in his newsletter, and you have them here in your book, um, it, you know, the, the Chardonnays, the whites dominated. They didn't just win. Yeah. Uh, I think the top six spots were four of them were were California or at least half and yeah. the Reds weren't didn't fare quite as well, but they did very well besides Warren's, you know, top position. Uh, the other brands did really well too. And so I, I just, you know, so here's, so it happened. Okay. It happened. And there's the stories of the judges wanting their, their uh, scorecards back. And don't you dare, you know, take this off my desk and publish it. And <laughs> well, <laughs> Yeah, well, yeah, they were. They're, they're, they figured their job was on the on the on the low. Yeah, it could be on the line. Right? <laughs> yeah, on Crayab, you know, this is impossible. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so you have these results, but it's still right. Is it still a story at that point? Is it a story yet? Um, you know, it's probably confined to the the, the streets of Paris at that point. Um, even in your um, 
magazine article. I mean, I'm going to pull it out here and just show the audience that's watching the uh, that's watching the podcast. Uh, even the that's just one column uh, in the in the magazine, right? It's just it's not it's kind of buried deep in the thing, and I don't even see a byline. There's no byline. <laughs> You know, time time did have had, had you know all the, sto the stories in the magazine were not you know written all the you know, covered by somebody all the time. Yeah, that was so there it right. is. Was, it, was there was there a chance that this was not going to get published? Uh, it, it could have well have happened because uh, I, I think if the California wines had had. Um, one say half of the com competition, I think the time would not have published the, the story. Really? It had to be that the California wines had won in both categories, both California and, and French were, were, had, had won. Then, you know, then it was, uh, then, then you had a good story. <laughs> it was, but it was still a sort of a slow propagation around the States for this to mean anything. It just seemed like it right. still needed traction. Right. And I know that even, I think you mentioned the, the, your depth of your book is amazing uh, and understanding it. And I have all my friends that have read it now, like they talk about Mike Gerges now, and they talk about Warren Wojarski and, and here's, uh, you know, I think what was it, was it Mr. Barrett or Mr. Wojarski was just sort of like out in the, out in the vineyard and so he goes, Hey, we won. And they're like, okay, great. You know, what's for dinner? Well, yeah, you can't, they, they didn't have any contact that no b belief in what, that, that, that this, uh, this was going to, you know, change their whole lifetime <laughs> and, yeah, that's, right. and that's what it did you know it just made their lives it made their, their profits uh and everything just suddenly california wines were over the map uh were were World been, been, been expected uh to, to, to win for that that day and they got they got killed by by the french and it wasn't wasn't it also though at that time the French, the Bordeaux industry in particular, was sort of in, in, a, in a, ebbs and flows anyway, but it was not in a great state in the 70s. Uh, the popularity of its sales volume, uh, I think quality quality control was sort of, wasn't there a problem there? Yes, yeah. Yeah, the, 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 well, the, the French French winemakers had, had been, you know, been, been living on, off their old production many for many many years and they weren't they weren't living up to to their to, to their work and so that's why you know when it here when this Cal these california wines arrived yes. and what of all things were the the, the, the best wines that day were the california wines so it's so that's fascinating to me because because of those you know we we all, you and I know we've been in this business a long time we see it ebb and flow we see things come and go we see we see trends come and go Bordeaux you always thought it's been here for a hundred years or thousands of years really you know well since twelve hundred we you, you don't think that there's anything different than what you know today but there was these these issues then about quality and 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 production quality and. And now there's a chink in the wall, so to speak. Yeah. Uh, I want to just want to touch one thing. When you write a story like this, and you wrote your story, you went back to your your flat or your apartment, wherever you're staying, you wrote the story. And today it's so easy, right? We can just clip it to an email or even just you know write it live in somebody else's database. What did you do then? Did you type it yourself and mail it? What was it? A teletype? What happened? Well, no, it was it was you know the time time had you know because you know we had, they had. And stories for everything, you know, for for uh, you know st stories for for several com countries, uh, and so you know it was it was important to have a good copy, clean copy that would get to to Paris, and get and get to California. And how did that happen? Was it just the uh, mail? Uh, no, it, it was it, it was t telephone. You know. Oh, so t I see. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Because uh, you know, say we take it for granted today, right? We're, here you are, you, here you and I are talking on you know on a camera in Rhode Island, and we can say whatever we want, and it's instantaneous. But I, in 1975, that was a lot, a big difference. 76. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to read something. I'm going to read chapter 16, the first part of this uh, chapter, because I'm going to step back now that we've understand what the tasting was and what the impact in California on uh, California wine was, which we haven't quite corrects. But the, the first sentence of your book in, 19, in chapter 16 
page 155 is, in the summer of 1975, Patricia Gallagher was making plans to visit her sister in Palos Verdes Estates, a wealthy coastal community south of Los Angeles. Well, I told, my dad's 92 and uh, still doing great. And I was with him, I took him a copy of this book a few weeks ago and uh, I read him this sentence. He goes, oh yeah, she goes, she says she came in the store. I go, what do you mean? He goes, yeah, she came to the store, introduced herself of what she was doing and that she was on her way to Napa to, to choose some wines or do something. And she owned a little shop or was part of a shop in Paris. And my dad speaks French. So they had a little conversation. I said, you've never told me this story. Dad. I mean, this is important stuff. So it was this it, in your book. You talk about how she had to find a way to get to Napa. Well, she's obviously got up there, but find a way to, to decide on what wines should be included and then get them back there, which apparently in a logistical headache to get samples back to Stephen for the tasting. Yeah, because they were worried, very worried that the, the, that the, 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 the control people would, would not allow the, 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 the California wines to, to be, be. And so they, you know, they had to make sure to, to take the, the wines in with, with a group of, uh, of, of tourists that were coming in, you know, so it wasn't, it wasn't just, you know, any freelance guy just wandering in and he dumps a, a yeah, you know, right. lots it's of, like today. of wines. So <laughs> do you think it was a French import issue or a California export issue? Like the, getting them out's not a problem, but getting them in was the problem. Get, getting them, getting them into France was was it was where the the great problem was. Going to and there was some brainstorm with somebody that, that, that they're going to do this. They're going to put it with the tourists and their bags or whatever they're doing. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, so, the, so that you know, because they were always fearful that that the um, you know that somehow somebody's going to take take away these things and 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 you know, in in the whole story. Yeah. Right. So. How did she decide then, and it's in your book and I want people to read it, but she goes around and there's what, 50 wineries then? Maybe not even that many at that oh, time. Oh, no, in California? Oh, 15? No, 25. Maybe. Yeah, so she went and she tasted these things and she said, well, uh, did she taste them? Do you know if she tasted them on a, with an opinion of whether these things could win or just like, I need to find something that is competitive? Uh, well, she she wanted you know she wanted to get something that she was sure would have the the the, the expert expertise of, of of these winemakers to to turn out good wine products, you know. So you know, the, so because the, these the winemakers in these in those 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 days were you know most a lot of them. We're still not experts in this, you know. They they were, they were they were they were just still getting started in wine. Right, and so, which which I, I the story and I have Violet Gergich coming on the show next week actually, and I, I just can't wait to peel back Mike's story as an immigrant to or an immigrant to America, an immigrant from Croatia, and you know we know Mr. Barrett's story as a, a local attorney in Tor Torrance. Uh, who invested in this idea, which had to be a huge risk uh, to cool. think about. Uh, this run, which pretty much, I mean, now it's a beautiful, gorgeous place, and it's like it, it, it you know, Chateau Montalana exemplifies the lifestyle of Napa. And uh, but back then, you know, it been shuttered for how long? And here's like we're going to try and make wine. I mean, it, not as a and who had ever heard of them? Nobody. These are, were wineries. That, that nobody had ever heard of before. <laughs> so so there's no recommendation that, hey, hey, this is a very good wine. This will tell us. You know, these were just wines that happened to be there. Yeah. And so she tasted them and and decided, okay, we're going to get these back there. Uh, Warren's, Warren's story uh, is a little bit different, but what is this character that you think? You've got a Mike Gergich who's, who's had some training where he grew up. Uh, came to America. I love this. Love how you, the picture you painted of him landing in St. Helena and, you know, like almost leaving his, not, not even where to sleep that night mm -hmm. and uh, figuring out something, you know, just by the seat of his pants with his $32 sewn in his shoe. Um, <laughs> Mr. Barrett had 
you know, funds. He had investors. He was an attorney. He was a sharp guy. It's a whole different program. Just so, just, just to put on the table, um, his other son, Bo, is my brother's class at Palos Verdes High School. Oh. And I threatened uh, his secretary that if he didn't speak with me on the show soon, I would publish his high school photograph. <laughs> <laughs> so, and then I surfed with the younger son, Kevin, who's not in the movie or not in the in part of the wine because we were very young then, but uh, that relationship goes really far back. But, you know, Warren came here to America or to California looking for something else, uh, a break from his lifestyle. And there weren't, uh, I, I, I can't remember in your book, if you talk about UC Davis having an enology school then, was it something you could do then or was it not even around? No, they, they didn't even have anything like that in, in those days. So it was all bootstrap stuff. Yes, yeah. yeah they, you know, there, there were only two or three people, you know, only maybe half a dozen or so um, people making wine in those days. I mean, you know, and I suppose why they bounced been, around too. Pardon me? I suppose why they bounced around a little bit too, where Mike Gergich had worked at all those places and uh, Warren's experience doing the same. Uh, because this is what fascinates me about the wine business. And I don't know about you, but my sort of, and I, this is my 30th year of tasting wines. I think I've calculated somewhere around 100,000, some ridiculous number. <laughs> With a totally different approach. I mean, my approach is like based on value, but um, uh, it, it, it fascinates me to see people like that. They didn't go to chemistry school. They didn't go to biology. They didn't study biology. They didn't study farming. Uh, they had a, a passion and a whim and an idea. Maybe not that's, unlike that's yours. The key. That's the key. That's the key to the whole story. They had the, the, the passion for it. To so just say, uh, whatever okay. my headwinds are going to be, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to survive them. Yeah, yeah. And what? And so what is it to you then that wine does that? Because it's bitten me now. And it took, it, I didn't have it 30 years ago. I was just business for me. And I've, my career's, you know, not as elaborate as most, but it's, it's interesting. But I, it took, I'm going to say maybe the last five years. So 25 years of tasting wines where I said, you know, it took a little while for the aha moment, whatever you want to call it, the uh, uh, the moment I say like the ratatouille moment where the food critic tastes that ratatouille for the first time, they reminded me of his mother's cooking. What what was it about George Tabor's? Was it the tasting itself that's where you decide, wow, this is really now a fascinating thing, or was it prior to that? No, because you know, again, I was I was a, a, a reporter for Time Magazine in those those days. Uh, and, you know, you had to, to do all sorts of stories, you know, pick stories about, you know, this, this subject or that subject or this, this, or this new thing, this old thing, whatever it is. And so, you know, this, the, the tasting uh, at the, at the, of the Paris tasting was, you know, it would have been very easy for me not to have gone that day uh, <laughs> because mean- nobody else was there. And so, you some young French girl walks by, bumps you on the Champs Elysees, and you're, she's like, "Let's have a drink," and you're done. You're not going to go to the table. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah that, but, you, that, that, but you had you had to submit the idea first. Is that correct? That what yes, I, read the I had to tell. I had to tell tell Time, Time Magazine, "Hey, there was this event that's going to be the, next week in Paris," and 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 uh, I think it's, it's an interesting story. It's, it's, you know, some, uh, some of the people in the, are here, uh, but then go to it, taste taste it, and see what happens. And you know, chances are the California wines are are not going to do very well, but that's okay. But you know, just we'll, we'll just see what happens. See what happens. So, but so were you? You were. I know that you were going to Stephen's class today, but did you really like yes. have this? ethereal experience with wine yet? Did you really realize this is not just an alcoholic beverage? It actually is a representative, like Mike Salachi of Opus One says, it represents a time and a place uh, for that bottle of wine. Had that happened yet or he just still was, I was still in Paris enjoying uh, cassoulet and, you know, wine? Well, I was, you know, I was, had been working in, in France at that point for well, well over a year 
maybe even up to two years. I have to, I have to I should, should check on that exactly for her. But I, I, it was, you know, I'd been there. I've, I, I spoke very good French so I could get around, you know, get the stories, get all the stories, have the interesting things. And this was just another different story that day. No, it's just, it's and, just... You know, it's something else. And we, and we even care, care, covered a whole part of the world up the, in those days. Uh, you know, we, we went down to the uh, other, other parts of, of France to, to do other stories. And so, you know, all, it, it, would, it would have been a very easy thing for me for, to skip the story and go off and pick up something else. Fortunately, it didn't happen. I went it does it, it does. To, to the one in, in Paris. Phenomenal. It does it. That's some, that's, 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 there's luck, damn luck and stupidity. Yeah, I suppose, <laughs> but, you know, I'm, I'm a firm believer in luck uh, is a preparation meets opportunity and, you know, the things that you, that, that what you were able to produce, uh, maybe the fact that a young French woman didn't bump you on the Champs Elysees and you went off with her is luck. But you, know, <laughs> you being there, you being there at the time this is happening and thinking maybe this is a story that all comes just from experience and, and being part of the program. What, tell me about the the other parts of France at that time, the wine districts. You've got the south of France. You got the Languedoc. You've got Burgundy, of course, which is obviously very famous at the time. But the Chateau de the Pop, the Rhone area, um, were those considered? Um, elegant places for wine, places for wine that people would study or be interested in knowing? Oh, yes. You know, they're, they're the great wines of France, you know, no matter where they were. But the, 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 the thing was that the, the, since in Paris, it was easier to get around the stories and, and you know, pick, pick up stories and pick up and decide this is the one that's going to be. Yeah. And that's what it would happen that day was that, you know, I, I could have gone to, you know, some stories in, in Belgium, you know, or around there, any place in France. But, you know, I, I decided to pick out and, and, and propose to, to time that, and not say, you know, you know I, I, I didn't predict the story to, to, uh, to the time editors. And I just said, hey, there's something's going to be happening next week. Uh, I think it might be interesting. So I'm going to go ahead and take a story, take, take a, a, a picture that day uh, and see what happens. Who knows? How many, how many other George Tabers were there in France at the time for Time Magazine in Paris? Uh, there were, well, there were a, a total of all of the, 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 the the st staff at that time, it would, have, it would have been three or four main okay. re reporters. So that's where it's not luck, George. It's you had an interest in something and you saw yeah. the opportunity and it happened. That's, yeah. that's incredible. So I'm going to read you um, a, a paragraph from um, Ernest Hemingway's book. And I want to talk about you know the, the societal value of wine in, in general. So he writes this. As I ate the oysters with the strong taste of the sea and their faint metallic taste that the cold wine washed away, leaving only the sea taste and the succulent texture, and as I drank their cold liquid from each shell and washed it down with crisp taste of the wine, I lost the empty feeling and began to be happy and to make plans. And that last sentence for me is a, is a huge sentence for uh, what I tell my customers, what I try to instill in the value of a good of a good glass of wine because it loses the empty feeling and it, you you want to make plans so to speak and you don't do that with beer you don't do it with gin you don't do it with bourbon but you do it with wine and to me that ethereal value is what makes this beverage you know this ancient beverage right i mean uh they found it an intact armenian you know, I'm Armenian, so they we, we know these things, but they found this 6,000 year old winery, you know, buried in the dirt with shoes and amphora, right? So, so somewhere in the history of man, somebody fermented a grape or the grape fermented on its own and they bit into it. And this is, this was pretty good stuff, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so it seems to me the lifestyle, the French lifestyle, and I talked about this with, um, uh, with Rex Pickett, the guy that wrote sideways, uh, 
the French paradox, which was, you know, they've been drinking wine forever and they've, they're thinner than Americans. They live longer than Americans and they take life slower than Americans. Was that something that, that intrigued you with, with being in Paris and that slow food and a good glass of wine? Oh, absolutely. Because, you know, you, you, the France was the, was the high point of everything that, that you could do in Europe at that point. You know, I, it, I could have gone to, to Germany or Belgium or other places, but if you wanted to go to a really great country with great wines, great pol politics, great stories, you know, go to Paris. That's uh, that's what I wanted to do was to go to Paris. Would you would you tell young journalists or young enthusiasts for wine even, hey, you know, go go to Paris, learn another culture, learn another language? Had you like you said, you speak you spoke very good French, which I study French now, and it's it's a tough language, right? Uh, yeah. Did you know French before you got there? I had studied in, in college. Oh, so. I had two two years of college, but but that would that, that didn't get me very far. <laughs> it's when you get there, you realize you didn't learn anything, right? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's, it's so much different now. But would you would so would you make that recommendation? If somebody came to you today, a journalist or a young college student that just got out of college, is like, what do you want to do? Like I did yesterday with this young lady, she's like, I want to learn about wine. I'm like, well, you know, you can read all the books you want. Uh, but until you sit down and taste it with people and, and learn a culture around it, it's going to be difficult to understand it. I totally agree with you. You know, you, you've got to experience it. You got to see what it was, it's all about. Uh, you know, what, you know, what, what, it, what it is. And the, and because the French would, would love to talk to you about wine. They will yes. not ever, yeah. you know, throw you out saying, you know, hey, you, you know about wine. No, yeah, no. right. <laughs> they, they, they love their wine. They love their and wine. They will help you love wine as well. It's, it's interesting because you said that, that, that when we use the word passion between the California winemakers at the time of the 70s and, and, and maybe my, my renaissance of, of understanding this is come about from doing these conversations. I've been, on, I've been doing videos with winemakers for, for probably 10 years now. And it's the formula starts to come around. The formula yeah. is not the chemistry. You know, like we talked about earlier, you can go to school to learn the chemistry, but these guys are making wines that today are still fantastic wines without the chemistry, right? It was the, 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 the value of the bootstrap education. And, uh, but one thing for sure that I get out of winemakers from all over the world, whether it's Croatia or, or Italy or France, is there's a deep rooted, um, and passion almost now at this point doesn't doesn't even work. It's just a love. They they yeah. love it, the the wine that they're they're working with. It's so interesting to me that that is part of. It. All right, so we so we win. We won. We won this yeah. thing. And it's like what? And it gets printed in the Time magazine. It's got a, a little blurb. We don't even know who George Tabor is yet, and it kind of starts to snowball around uh, that this thing won. And my dad wrote about it. I think in August of. I think it was in the August newsletter of uh, 1976. When did it have the sort of sales, let's talk business. When did it have the sales pull through? When it was like, oh my God, we're going to run out of Chateau 73 Montalena Chard. And we're going to run out of the Stag's Leap Cab. When did that happen? As soon as the story got into the paper the, the following week, as soon as Americans saw what was happening, then they, they started rushing all around the country to see, hey, do you, you have these, these wines? Can we buy the, these wines? Where can we find, buy these wines? Hey, these wines, they're supposed to be really great. You got to tell me where, I, where can I get them? You know, so they, the big retailer back then was um, uh, in New York, Ackerman, uh, Merrill and Ackerman. And yeah. one of the big retailers back then. Uh, were the wines even distributed on the East Coast by then? Do you do you know if 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 you could get very Monty very Leonard, few, very few? I mean, who would have who would have done that, right? Because there wasn't market for it. Yeah, who cared? <laughs> um, so so now vintage seventy four. I can't remember the seventy four Chateau Montalena because we had it. I'm sure we had it. Mister Mer Mister Barrett used to come to my dad's store all the time, and he's like, one day he comes to my dad's store. He goes, "Hey, Paul." He goes, "My dad's name was Paul." Also, he says. 
can you help me out? I go, everybody in Palos Verdes wants to, you know, all the socialites, right? They all want to uh, have me, um, they all want to, uh, me to donate wines. So <laughs> can you just put them in the store so I can just send them to your place? <laughs> and I was like, sure, I'll put them in. So we had the, we had the Riesling and we had the, the, the Chardonnay and we had whatever else they were making at the time, uh, two years before the tasting. Um, but there, at that time, too, in, Calif in Palos Verdes, we had, um, God, who was the, uh, the other family that started in their big winery? My dad used to feel like he was outclassed, like this yeah, was now yeah, this elite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, they're, I, I, my mind right now escapes me. But I, I don't, I, as a young guy stocking the shelves, I don't remember a surge. I don't remember those things. I was too young. I do know that. Warren stayed at our house and this was before the tasting. Um, my dad bought his Riesling cause he couldn't afford the cab at the time. And, and I was just looking at on my office, I have the old flip boards that whenever I was a kid, when I was a kid at the cash register and somebody bought a bottle of wine, my, we didn't price them on the bottle. You would come and put it on the counter and then it, you would flip through this board sheet that my dad had. And so I, I have some on my desk and we have all these things. We have, uh, you know, we have Burgess and we had uh, Stone Creek or Stone Valley. We had um, um, uh, Montalena. We had uh, Stag's Leap and they were like $2 and 50 cents, you know, <laughs> for the whites. <laughs> so, and the reds were like what, four or five bucks, I think, or six bucks was like a big expensive, uh, Cabernet at the time. So do you think then it's, it's, you know, it's almost impossible today to go to Napa and buy a, and buy a land and expect to make any money. Yeah. And it's almost that these iconic brands that have been around forever, Burgess and Stag's Leap and Chateau Montalena, if they haven't sold to corporate America yet, um, that, that have the land paid off and now they're getting premium money for the wines because of the history. Um, did you get a piece of that, George? Did anybody thank you? By <laughs> not, not, not one bit. <laughs> and, you know, and, and the, 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 the winemakers uh, at, at that point, you know, they, they didn't really, you know, they had a, they had a tough time selling wines. Yeah. And, and, and then until the, the Time Magazine story came out. As soon as the Time Magazine story came out, people could come rushing out, especially out of New York and the you know the big big capital cities, uh, and then they just said you know hey do you have any of this this California wine from from Montalena? I don't know what the name of it is, but something like that, and, and you know find me a case of that. Phenomenal. <laughs> yeah. And so the, then the rush the, then the rush had to happen. Then then the rush happened, and it was. It, to Napa and, crazy and, and you know Napa was never the same again <laughs> and it's now it's different again I we start we sort of prefer Sonoma to to the extent that it's less commercial now right. uh, Paso Robles being you know coming onto the map is uh, still a cowboy town yeah. and Napa's gotten you know pretty commercial and the I was interviewed by the Napa Valley Register recently on the wine gal, and it was not an interview about me. I thought it was going to be about my business and what we've done all these years, but it was about how can we help these wineries compete now because it's so expensive to produce wine in Napa that you have to sell it for $100 a bottle or more, and the marketplace for those things isn't that big. You know, the iconic brands like Camus and Silver Oak, they are, they're getting it, but if you're a boutique guy and you have to charge 150 bucks a bottle and nobody knows who you are, it's a, it's a tough animal. Oh yeah. It's a really tough animal. Now I can tell you, George, that COVID has been amazing for my business. Anybody that's direct to the consumer in America that had, had all the pieces in place. Uh, I, I'm waiting for COVID 20 because it may be politically incorrect to say, but <laughs> we're selling a ton of wine right now. All right. Well, this is a, you know, we could talk, and I, I hope we can do it again, but I want to close with the next 10 minutes or so about the book on cork, because uh, when I looked you up uh, to talk about some of the things, and I saw this book, uh, Le Bouche, in French, right? Le Bouche. Um, what, what compelled somebody? Yeah, yeah, there's a copy there. <laughs> okay. What okay. would compel somebody to write a book on corks? Well, you know, after the, you know, after the Paris tasting, you know, I could could write it, 
you know, about any book that I wanted to. Yeah, right. <laughs> the, the, the publishers suddenly kept, <laughs> discovered me. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, the, the, these, these things turned out to be just outstanding subjects that, uh, that uh, they could learn a lot more about winery. As, as you know, as, 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 uh, as all, all the, I wanted to, to learn about all the great wines of the world. And that's how I... That's how it happened. So you, you, you dispelled like the, the first few pages, which I haven't finished the book all the way, but you, you completely ruined my social club. You know, I give speeches <laughs> at the Rotary Club in Kiwanis and they all about wine. Totally blew my rap because uh, I have a piece of cork from my uncle Art, who passed away last year, two years ago, had participated with Coca-Cola in 1970, 1985 in, in assembling a piece of synthetic cork to a bar cap to make a bar cap closure for Taylor Sellers. So this is, this is way before the idea of a foam synthetic cork was being used in St. Francis or Barefoot Sellers or whoever was using it, you know, in the early 90s. Uh, and you said in the book that Dom Perignon did not invent the cork, and that's that's one of my trivia questions, you know. <laughs> Who invented the cork for wine? I was, oh, Dom Perignon, the blind monk. And, they, and then also, I think you said there he's no, he wasn't even blind. Maybe he wasn't. <laughs> he actually could see. And so now I have to change all my trivia questions because of uh, I've a, read the book. A, <laughs> <laughs> but this is a it's a fascinating story, and I think it's important for people to understand because it is a question that I get. Probably one of the most prolific questions I get is, you know, what's the screw cap? You know, what's the point of it? Why is, is it better or worse? Is that a cork? And and so. Um, but you just thought it was an interesting subject to peel back, uh, to have people understand, because you really dug deep into it. Yeah, because it's you know it it is a it, it's a it's a di it's a difficult subject. There's no question. It's not it's not an easy subject, uh, you know, to to make these these wines and then sell them to other other places. And and so you know, I, I thought it was really important to learn about you know what. The, the great wines of the world were were made from, and how the Californian wines could could go come in with them. Yeah, you did it. You know, I forgot that part too. You've got some amazing uh, depth in New Zealand here. Um, I wanted to. Uh, I just lost a, a train of thought, but it was the the screw cap, which is when I was stocking the shelf in 1976 you know, 1975, and it was Gallo, you know, Rhine wine and red burgundy and that stuff, Chablis, or my uncle would call it Chablis. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it always connotated a negative thing. And the general public um, thinks the, the, the cork is this romantic thing, which is true. And I just did a, a whole special uh, email on canned wines. You know that I tasted probably, I don't know, maybe 75 canned wines. I found five really good wines. I found a Russian Riven Pinot in a 250 mm -hmm. ml. I found a, a, a Lodi Cab Vintage in a 187 that was very good. You pour it in a glass, people have a hard time even thinking it's canned. Uh, but I, I have to tell you, I, I, in a whim, it was a mistake, uh, applied to study under the MW program. Now, I'm 61. It's probably not a great time to start but I decided I would try. And one of the questions that I got for the application was what's happening with the, the marketing of wine and the value of the closure and uh, do, should we keep up with the times for like cans or Tetra packs or those kinds of things. And I, and I wrote this, this is actually the best part of my application that as far as they are concerned that they liked, because I had a, um, I had a kid ask me just weeks before, uh, to help them understand the packaging of a, of a CBD drink, you know, the CBD oil, the stuff that they harvest from marijuana that is not the hallucinogenic part or the narcotic part. It's a, it's supposed to make you feel better like aspirin. Yeah. He was making a drink out of it. <laughs> and he was asking me, you know, Mr. Callum Karen, what do you think I should do with this? Should I put it in a cork? We want, we want the elegance of a cork, pull the cork out of the bottle and make the sound. And I wrote this in the, in the application to the master of wine. They liked this because it was a contemporary uh, application of, of a closure. But the punchline was I asked the kid, I go, what does it taste like? He goes, it tastes like crap. 
<laughs> so, so uh, how was this book received by people? Was it? Uh, the, the, the book has done very well. As I mean, did. you know, the, um, because uh, Americans are still learning about wine and you know so the, so the book is 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 part of 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 the of their education it's a it's one of the most and i couldn't believe that it had been done but it's a very granular look at what um what was happening i want to tell you a quick story and we'll get you off because i know you have a hard stop but when my uncle art was working with Coca-Cola on this Taylor Sellers cork and he was, he, his job, he was an MIT master's mechanical engineer. So his job was to take the synthetic cork, the little bar top size and glue it to the bar cap. And he had to make the machine that would do that oriented and all that stuff. In the meantime, the company in Ontario, I forgot the name of it now, was using synthetic corks. And um, uh, it was St. Francis was one of the few wineries that was using it in California. And I think Barefoot Sellers was using it. And I said, let's go out. Unc, and we'll go see this machine. So we go to the machine, we climb around. I, I'm, I'm, I position myself as bottling some wine and he was my engineer and we had overalls on and we, they take us back into the warehouse and there's the machine making corks. And we get in the car, this is how brilliant the guy was. He says, it'll never work. Yeah. I go, why not? He goes, because the machine they're using is for Italian shoe, shoe soles. And he goes, the temperature of the foam as it gets to the outer mold is gonna be different than the inner mold and they're gonna have inconsistent corks. And then he explained to me why the cell size would be different. And so we got back to the house and we cut the corks in half and he was exactly right. So I called Mike Houlihan at Barefoot and I called the St. Francis winemaker, I forgot his name at the time. I go, how's it going? He goes, well, it's going okay, but every now and then the cork bends and doesn't go in the bottle. <laughs> and it was exactly the symptom that Art was telling us about, which was the cell structure of the cork. So um, I want to thank you for this time, George. I know you have to get off and I want to, I want to, reserve the right to come out and see you and do this live and, and peel it back a little bit more or potentially do it again on zoom calls. But it's been a fascinating conversation and I, and we appreciate what you brought to the industry. I can tell you that I thank you because my career has been based on <laughs> the fact that you did this. <laughs> so, well, I, I was lucky. <laughs> well, I don't know. I could, have, I could have gone, you know, that day to a, another story and you know, oh, no. California wines probably would have become known, you know, five or ten years later. But but you know, it was lucky that that day in Paris, and I was there. Somebody put you there at the right time, at the right place, for the right story, to the world, and that's the part that really is really special for what you've done. So thanks again for the time. Thank um, you. I'll send you a link to this when it gets posted, and I hope I can come see you in Rhode Island or Vero Beach. Maybe that'll be better. <laughs> okay. Well, let, let me get to California. <laughs> okay, yeah, that too. We'll be here. I know Stephen's coming. Uh, I can't remember if it's October or November, but he'll be in Napa. And um, if you're available, join us up there. Yeah. Okay, great. Cheers. Thank okay, you. Good to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Wine Talks with Paul, Callum, Karen. Don't forget to subscribe because there's more great interviews on their way. And of course, all these podcasts are sponsored by the original Wine of the Month Club, 48 years in business. Don't forget to visit our website, wineofthemonthclub.com. Folks, have a great time out there in the wine world. Cheers.